Welcome everyone to What the Force. I'm Marie Claire Gould, your host, and we are returning with Bad Batch Report to cover all of the episodes of The Bad Batch. And joining me once again is my co-host in life and this podcast, Kyle Gould. Welcome back. I'm back. <laughs> Hooray. You're not directing a play. Insert two seconds of silence for everyone to cheer and smile. Uh, yeah, I'm not directing a play. I'm really sorry <laughs> I missed out on season two. I was directing a community theater musical last go around for season two. And while that I would say that was a super fulfilling opportunity, I really did miss this. Like with you <laughs> and everyone listening. And We didn't do Death Count while you were away, but I did have excellent fill-in hosts of Molly and Michelle, who are big Bad Batch fans. It's true. And Molly's got- even on another podcast doing the big Bad Batch thing herself now that's, that's for season great. three. And uh, you had the opportunity to meet both of them when we were at Star Wars Celebration last year. So. Yeah, I did. The delightful human beings that are Michelle and Molly. Yes. So uh, I... I'm endlessly thankful for them to fill in while you were busy, but it is nice to have you back to cover a show with you. It's nice to be back covering this show. (laughs) There's so many other shows that I'm like, oh, we should have covered that, like House of Ninjas or the like. The, oh, no, we the still... new Avatar. There's so much good TV out there right now that it's really raised the bar on requirement for content to me. Right. You're right. Like, I mean, we could still talk about House of Ninjas if you wanted to, which we, you and I, like binged over the course of the weekend. Yeah, a lot of stuff going on in that show. It was really fun. Yeah. yeah. A lot of strange. No, I could, I could no, definitely we... dive into no, it. No, we can't. But like, just no. as a teaser, there's a lot of strange, like, connections to North American style storytelling that don't leave you satisfied because it seems like it's going to be a North American style television story but Mm. then it's because it's it's root is in Japanese storytelling it doesn't go the way you think it's going to go because (laughs) it's rooted in another culture's fundamental storytelling that's interesting to me yeah it's very transformative from a uh, how how it plays out but i but i think it's because the team that created it was very mixed from japanese oh, absolutely. and absolutely north american culture um anyways what are we doing what are we talking about oh bad batch yes let's let's get confined <laughs> it's, let's to let's, the thing we're talking about okay so uh release this week was the first three episodes of the bad batch season three confined paths unknown and shadows of tantis and you and i both talked after we watched and we both said Yes, these three episodes needed to be released together because they're basically one long episode. (laughs) Also, somebody didn't say paths unknown out loud. I think it was only ever typed and read read because Mm. like you it totally reads really nicely. But then as soon as you say out loud paths unknown, (laughs) it sounds terrible. (laughs) It is terrible. I'm that's right. I'm back and I'm here to criticize all the titles for this show. That is what <laughs> criticism count should be knocked right on the bird right there every time there's a title just like this first episode confined. Uh was there something that you wanted to talk about the show or the production before we got into confined? Well, how do you want to do this? I've got little snippets about the specific people involved in each of these shows. Uh, uh let's we we always used to do that first, so that's fine. Sure. Yeah. All right, directed by Saul Ruiz, written by Jennifer Corbett, and executive produced by the executive production team of Jennifer Corbett and Brad Rao. I learned yep. something really interesting in that Jennifer Corbett comes from a writing group, like she is a writer principally, and Rao is himself, typically he comes from the production side of things. Mm. So he's more like pipeline and organizational stuff. And so it's interesting to see how the two of them have come to work together. They've really learned a lot about the other's processes in the creation of the Bad Batch show. It's like a perfect partnership of skill sets that lean on each other and knowing the top end things as they do. Uh, There's been some recent articles and reviews about how the two of them have come to lean on each other and learn from each other. That's awesome. Yep. Uh, Anything you want to say about the production for this episode? Uh, Gwendolyn Yao. Yo, Gwendolyn Gwendolyn Yo has been the uh, actress who's done the voice of Nala Se for 
of uh, the whole time ever since Clone Wars. So we're going like eight years worth of it. And it is very interesting to listen to how she did Nella Say's voice in the early episodes. Much mm. more strident, much more dominant, much more like I'm I have authority. Yeah. And then opening in season three, it almost sounded like an entirely different voice actress because she's very uh I don't know, motherly <laughs> is well, the only way defeated. I could think defeated like, yeah trapped herself confined mm, yeah no I, I, yeah i think that it's nice when they can find the voice actors and bring them back for multiple roles um i mean you know d has been with the production the whole time as the clones in yeah. the animation form so yeah bad batch is definitely a continuation of the clone wars in so many ways absolutely no it, it really is the continue it's there's so much connective tissue happening here. And I'll get into this with some discussion on the other episodes. It's not so much in this one. But like when they mention things like M count mm -hmm. and whatnot, you mm -hmm. really like they're trying to, well, they're trying to take back midichlorians, but leave them in, which is just weird. Just use the word. Piss the people off that you're going to piss off and <laughs> make me love you because I love you. Because I love midichlorians and I, I never do. thought that was a bad idea. Uh, yeah, M count and also like building the connective tissue to the rise of Skywalker, um, which... Okay, do you want my rant now or do you want my do rant it. later? <laughs> I, I have a lot of cool little bitty details here to jump in with as you go along, but rant away. Okay, so I've always struggled with the idea of what they've, they're they trying to do and what was effectively done with The Rise of Skywalker, which was bring back some of the extended you know, universe canon mm -hmm. and especially the cloning aspect of Emperor Palpatine. Um and especially how it's playing out now, Project Necromancer, which has been a thing in canon, quote unquote, since The Mandalorian. Sure. Oh, we're going all the way to see, to episode three here because that's when it gets referenced. I know. But but the connective tissue to The Rise of Skywalker is what they're playing with. Exactly. And it, it's super frustrating for me because it feels like necromancy, not magic. <laughs> More, more specific ma magic, you mean? Or just because it's like it only science? It's only science. And yeah. the idea, the obsession with like DNA and like what makes up a person and using science over the friggin force and like right. the magic or mm -hmm. just like the the <clears throat> sort of um, it, there was a stylistic choice in the original Star Wars to have things seem... Um, retro but technological <laughs> retro technological yep. and uh this feels a little too horror. oh you're putting too much sci-fi horror in my sci fantasy yeah, yeah exactly like it just feels like it's leaning towards the necromantic or the suddenly it's all frankenstein's monsters right rather than um you know what it has been which has been sci fantasy <laughs> well they're, they're frankenstein's monsters instead of the monster of your own making yeah and the the internalized monster yeah, that you are choices. facing these are like yep. othering it's it's othering things within the galaxy absolutely and it, that's what a lot of the extended universe did mm -hmm. with the vong with the cloning mm -hmm. right but the power of Star Wars has always been in the internal struggle. Yeah, you don't explain the myth. That's usually what, you know, you try not <laughs> to do It's why people that. have a problem with the M count. I mean, midichlorian count. Exactly. Right? They hate that because they explained the magic. Yeah. It's like it's like when you find out how a um, magic trick is done. But did they? <laughs> no, they didn't really. But... But, you know, like they just said, like many chlorines show up when you have a lot of the force power. Exactly. And people assume that means that that means that you you're, have you're, you're born stronger with it. Yeah. Like, you're, it, you're, are you born with it? Is it just Maybelline? Is that what M count stands for? It's like maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's your M count Maybelline. Maybe it's midi chlorines. Right. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, I just it feels it feels antithetical to what I view as Star Wars. And I have always struck. I really struggled with the rise of yeah. Skywalker because of that. And, and on a whole bunch of whole bunch of other reasons. But like, it just feels like there's it. It feels like it's going down a path that I can't follow because I've never been a fan of the right science fiction horror. 
so I have a pro- I have a question then. It's twofold okay. about these M count. One, what's Sabine Wren's M count? Has it gone up? Was it the same as it was before? Does your M count change over time? Like if you're if you're really good and you cut down on carbs and you know, you know those cholesterols, does your cholesterol count? It can be reduced over time if you healthy eating and living, right? Is it like that where you're more connected with the force and you're more spiritual? Your M count grows. I don't or know. <laughs> is it just set and that's what you have for your entire life? Because if that's the case, how does Sabine start to be? make better use of the force and then as well why do they keep testing the clones they keep they can't like how many times does Did they test omega the clones? get tested because it seemed like and this is one of my main fa- fallacies since we're in this area already about the yeah. whole over arc they freaking test omega four times on camera on screen mm-hmm. but then later on when it's like it's one of the bad batch sort of illusion that's made and it allows hemlock to say no no we've tested ct9904 and he was and he was not a good he wasn't a good match well okay that means they've already tested him and they've discounted him why are they testing omega so many many times Uh, it feels like they're testing a whole bunch of people or maybe like m emerly or m emery 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 had a gut instinct that she okay you can't view bad batch episodes too too closely because no, you can't. no 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 because a lot of what they do is incredibly symbolic and i feel like one of the writers on the writing team has read the same books as me because i can point to very specific motifs sure. that they're utilizing that i'm like that that's a direct parallel to this it, mythical well-known mythical story and i'm going to get into that when we talk about it but essentially it was just a way to show that um oh what's her name nala say was protecting her right oh yeah absolutely that's it like it it doesn't actually do anything for the story to say yeah maybe it was taking that long to go through all the clones that they had in captivity and they were do- only doing 10 at a time or something right I that no right but why they were always testing her was to show that that Nala say was always protecting her right but they did not need to tell us that ct9904 had already been tested and he was he was bad because it it lent some strange motivation to why they kept testing omega they if they should have just should have just cut that line or changed that line in some capacity Mm -hmm. to allow for the because it's great and from a motif and repetition and not you're not just Mm -hmm. confined but everything moves so slowly and there's no change in what's going on and they've done that so well in this opening episode with the amount of time it took like when it cuts away from hemlock at the very opening Mm -hmm. to find where omega is it's a two-second hold yeah on the corridor a two second hold on the door itself a two second hold on the water as it slowly drips out of the fountain before it pans to omega to tell us this person is trapped they've been here a while mm. and they are they're stationary and unmoving unmoving yeah i i th- so i have a few thoughts on that but i i honestly i wasn't bothered as much as you were by that my only sort of again rent over i love these episodes i should have said that up front but oh yeah i love these episodes i feel like bad batch has gotten uh more sophisticated with the storytelling and the trust of the audience to do an episode like the first episode which is literally just purgatory made real why does it seem like so much (laughs) more happens in the first episode than in the second episode it's because there's a lot of emotional change that happens right? uh through that episode yeah and i feel like the storytellers again their sophistication has uh matured over the course of these seasons to allow the time mm-hmm. for us to feel the pain of the situation that amigo is in like she's she's literally so trapped there is such redundancy in her life that she's not changing she is emotionally stuck and there's a few things that are going on from a thematic and mythic motif perspective that i do want to point out is that okay absolutely but first she can't even emote with anyone oh i know she's trying to connect with the lurker hound that's not working out to begin with she's trying to connect with emery that's not working at all this tech 
version of a character who's come into her life who never takes off their Google Glass ever <laughs> has will never leave her life, never change at all. In even crosshair isn't emoting and empathizing with mm -hmm. her. So everyone around her is also confined and trapped in the same way that she is, and she can't connect with anyone. And Last season, I pointed out that Mount Tantis will equate to an underworld situation where essentially they're in Hades. They're in the underworld. They're stuck where they are and they cannot emotionally or spiritually grow while they are in that location. And that is incredibly shown, like how you just said. Um, Mount Tantis also, um, as it's well documented, comes from the name Tantalus, which is... Um, when it was originally created in the EU, was specifically pulled on to draw a parallel to the Tantalus myth, the house of Atreus, to do with the consumption of the children of the house and the curse of the house of Atreus. And so we have a lot of this idea of creating to consume, and we see it shown quite clearly in Hemlock being unwilling to rescue people that are downed outside of the perimeter of his sort of control. Just to jump in, um, Hemlock pisses me off <laughs> so much. I hate this character. I hate especially his stupid little eyebrow slit that they've given to give him this like metro edgy. look. He's got this edgy, <laughs> stupid haircut and I hate him so much. His whole outfit pisses me off. He only wears one glove. Why are you wearing a single glove? Hemlock, what is the purpose of this single glove? Hemlock? His first name is Rice too. Uh, which... It just <laughs> drives me nuts. Also, he's played by Jimmy Simpson who is from Westworld and other movies and yeah. always plays that character that just gets under your skin like yeah. there's something going on i don't like you this is why and his <laughs> voice is perfect to this and they He's have very done, calm they've right? done an amazing job of giving us essentially a new rampart like yeah just replace rampart and i love his motivation is to get more power and to become the head mm -hmm. of the science department overall and he's willing to do whatever it takes to please his lord and master and palps is just grinning away and stroking his it's own like, palps yes, greed, satisfaction. yes. Ugh. it was great i hate him so much good work good work <laughs> uh so um we do see Omega grow older over the course of that first episode very right. quickly. Do you want to know how many days? Uh, how many days? I thought it was, I estimated about five months, but. Wow, that's very good. 150 days. There was 150 check marks on the thing. Ooh. The first time we see her doing that, it's the 21st. So she's been there for three weeks and that's the 21st check that she puts mm. on the thing. When we come back to her later after this really long fade, like we are literally on a fade for five full seconds of blackout before moving to the dripping water clock where it drips twice, showing us the prison window, which gives us a sense that it's a new season, a whole new mm -hmm, change mm -hmm. in the environment as fall has set upon the place and 150 days have that, passed. That's amazing. And her hair is also grown and she's shown she is showing uh markable marketed uh physical differences i wish that they had aged up the model yeah um i wish that that much time had passed but i guess like it's much cheaper to keep the kind of they're also physical model on timelines too yeah like it's like 18 bby or somewhere around there and they can't get around too much more time passing yeah it has to be pretty early on in the right? in the timeline so that they yeah no i definitely see that i just like i really was looking forward to omega physically being more grown up uh or going into teenagehood um just personally, because she has been shown to be so baby. <clears throat> yes. For much of the show. And it says something if she does not appear to be baby. Yeah. <laughs> from a storytelling perspective. Um, you talked about Nalise being uh, sort of this trapped, confined character as mm -hmm. well. And like uh, very, um, in some ways, has given up. Oh, or, absolutely. Or, you know, but just kind of going and and. In, in many ways, she's doing the things that um, you do in situations when 
you can't control anything. She controls the things that she can control, which is protecting Omega, discarding of her blood every single day <laughs> for five months. Is it every day? I feel like maybe it's not every day. Maybe we only saw the ones they did. Yeah. I mean, at least protecting her in that way. Yeah. Whenever Omega's blood came up, she was always there to protect her. And so this is where I need to bring up a myth <laughs> that uh, ties into both Nalise and Emery and even Thatcher and uh, Crosshair. And I will call it out as we talk through the episodes a little bit more. But sure, this is Vasilisa the Wise and Baba Yaga. Hmm. And I have really good evidence to say why they're compar- car- comparable. Specifically, Vasilisa the Wise is um, a Russian Eastern European folklore uh, very Cinderella like. She has a step family that does not like her very much. She ends up marrying a prince, dancing at a ball, becoming a princess down the road. But before that, she is actually sent on a mission after her mother dies. Her mother dies and bequeaths her with a small doll. Uh, which Vasilisa carries around with her. Um, her stepmother steps in and says, I don't like you, but we need fire. So you have to go to Baba Yaga and ask for fire. And so Vasilisa, saying, being a good stepchild, goes off to go and meet with Baba Yaga. That's the witch in the woods that lives in the house with the chicken feet. <laughs> it's a very, very scary character in folklore. Mm-hmm. And she comes and finds Vas- Vasilisa goes and finds Baba Yaga and she listens to her intuition, which is represented by the doll that she carries with her. The doll tells her in a small voice to listen to herself and to certain things that she needs to do. She does a bunch of tasks for Baba Yaga, Baba Yaga, but never lies to Baba Yaga, always just speaks this plain truth to who effectively is the wild mother or the dark mother in these in this story is able to bring fire back to the family. But it is a cursed skull that shoots flame from its eyes and it ends up burning the stepmother and uh, siblings to death when she returns. But the key point of the key point of the Vasilisa wise, the wise story is that you need to be listening to your own intuition to be able to escape the darkness that surrounds you and also to bring light out into the world. And to burn your stepmother. I mean. The light to burn your family. Well, they up, definitely get the fire, don't they? They get the fire. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Baba Yaga makes her like <clears throat> promise that she will just give them the fire. And there's a folklore is fun that way. Uh, yep. But. We see the parallels in Nalise being the too good mother, the mother who says, like, you know, you need to trust yourself. You need to you have all of the tools within you, Omega, but is protecting her for too long. And then you have the dark mother of Emery, who is never lied to, asks is Emery the dark mother. She is. Um, OK, because of I thought for a really long time last season that Emery, when we it were introduced to the character that she would end up being a Resh Kagal and Omega would end up being more like an Inanna, a descent to the underworld, facing your mirrored version of yourself, your sister in the underworld and what that represents from a growth and effectively puberty perspective for <laughs> Omega. I don't think it's that yet. Maybe it will be down the road, but I don't think it'll ever get there. But yeah, maybe. Maybe <clears throat> if if Emery comes back in a significant form. Uh, she definitely will be. The, 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 okay, so we're, we're jumping around, but the end of the third episode has uh, at least a three second hold on Emery's mm. face and it changes in emotional context after they've determined that she has gotten away. So they have they have not been able to reclaim Omega and there's an expression on her face that almost seems like good for you, kid. Right. Yeah. So Baba Yaga represents the forces of darkness that you can't fight against. Yeah. Like the wildness of the world or the fact that the sun always sets or it's like the the natural darkness of the world. And Emery herself offers help and support in the way that she can. Well, do you know what name Emery means? No, is it, it or is it like Emery Board? It, so that's what we would think of it in 
in in North American ling- language, right? Emery board, mm-hmm. and that would be like a way in w- a hard substance upon which uh, a thing is sharpened or worn down. But it's actually a German word. That particular spelling mm. of Emery is a word for strength at home, powerful and brave. Interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it's just when you're paired with two significant feminine. Mm-hmm. archetypes face to face it's very easy to see Nalase as the too good mother and Emery as the dark mother right yeah but they're they're te- they, I think they're more akin to sisters you than would, they are like that's where I was leaning with yeah. Arash Kagal and Inanna. Inanna but you have the doll and you have the focus on Emery giving Omega challenges tasks to complete just like Vasilisa was given tasks to like sort the grain from the from the um, sand or whatever, just like she had a, a ton of other challenges and tasks to do to prove her her worthiness. Mm-hmm. You have to be able to do these things. And Omega has helpers in Batcher and in Crosshair. <laughs> just <laughs> as much as crosshairs well he helper. does he does sort of help in that he he is there to listen to her right he doesn't have a choice he doesn't have a choice <laughs> you can tell that from the eye roll that he gives her when she first talks about escape which you pointed out something really yeah. interesting in that moment in the first episode where she's like she's like yeah we're gonna get out of here and escape and she's got this look on her face. And then yeah. I, all I noticed was the eye roll and head turn of him. And he's just like, oh, my God, I can't bear listening to this. But you noticed something. Yeah, actually, it was I was literally reading IMDb and it was something that popped up for that episode, which is that Joel Aaron actually pointed out that the shadows of Crosshair's cell fall onto Omega's face. And the shadows create an image on her face that looks like Crosshair's own face. Aaron confirmed um, when this like clip came out that um, the light shining down on Crosshair's face and all of that, uh, Crosshair is being cast as an angel. <laughs> and they use the lighting to draw the parallel uh, to Omega and Crosshair in that moment. And you c- can expect to see it throughout all of season three cool and it was purposefully done to underscore uh to underscore emotional scenes Mm -hmm. and he said it happens with other individuals creatures droids and ships what (laughs) like the crosshair image goes like like that uh, that things are being paralleled with shadows i mean that's just good work right there. I mean, it's just good visual storytelling. Exactly. That's what that is right there. And let's just take a moment to shout out too, because while the Bad Batch has gotten better for stories and better for characters as well, it has gotten better artistically too. Mm-hmm. The rain in the first episode is just so believable as actual rain. The you compared water to where effects, we've been with the Clone Wars to the right, and then like. the the detail work and the aging of the characters' costumes and art outfits and the the things that you can see on the spaceships. It's just so detailed and and de- there's depth to it. You can see the aging on things and the etching and the scratching and whatnot that's gone on. And then also you can see. Just the quality of art and graphics has improved because every time I saw a crosshair in his like pseudo prison jumpsuit of the nice yeah. gray, I was like, that is so nice. It looks so soft and comfy. <laughs> it looks like it has good texture. It does. It um, is like a fleecy suit. It's so nice. So there's another thing about Omega's character that I do want to bring up in these episodes, and it's how uh, she relates to Batcher. Um, which I love as a cute name that it's like Batch, Bad Batch, Batcher. Yep. He's like like the m- littlest version of all of them. Absolutely. The I love team it. Team mascot. Team mascot is, and I, I literally cannot wait until Batcher and Wrecker are hanging out together because I feel like they're going to be best friends. Yeah. <laughs> they are the same soul. <laughs> yes. Um, And also Crosshair. And even though she's... um. She's not really able to do anything for him. She still visits him and gives him comfort. And so this is really key because oftentimes the type of archetype that um, Omega is, which is a golden child 
or supernatural child, uh, mm-hmm. et cetera, like special child, mm-hmm. um, is often personified in their ability to create, nurture, heal. And uh, we've seen that from the beginning of the show with Omega, that she has the ability to do all of those things. And it's especially poignant when we have that character be a feminine character because it amplifies up the nurturing and uh, power of um, care and things like that. And so we end up having an actual example of Batcher being healed by Omega in the episode, but also just because of the visits to Crosshair, Omega is also healing. Yep. Uh, crosshair and so you have and healing emory and, heal- and healing yeah exactly now let's say and like like that is like i she said certainly this- isn't healing the technical droid in the stables oh no that no, guy no. he died he, bites it. he die. uh yeah but but it is it is a powerful motif that we see in these stories often um and it is it is something i've been saying since the beginning of the bad badge that she is like that missing feminine piece of this entire society that once reconnected heals it. Absolutely. I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. Why does Emery give Omega the doll back in that first episode? Yeah. So <laughs> uh, because of their, like the, the effect that Omega's had on her, like that's, that's the transformational moment that, yeah. and it's reflected in that way. It's pretty amazing. Um, I, I like it a great deal because that uh, that moment there led me to more sympathize with Emery because mm. she does a kindness. And then in the la- in the third episode, when they focus in on that look, I'm like, I cannot wait for their for more Emery story to be untold to be unfolded because there's a complex character behind the Google goggles, yeah, um, that she's got on and the Apple Glass, whatever it is, <laughs> and. I cannot wait to kind of experience it more. Also, the fact that we're just getting that much more Keisha Castle Hughes in the story, another New Zealander yep. who's just amazing. And I, I've loved everything she's been in since Whale Rider. Yeah. And I, I, I'm glad that she's got a return here to Star Wars. Um, I love it too. In this character. And that it ties as well because almost a similar, similar time frame of this first episode, Crosshair says to... Uh, Omega, he says, not every clone is your ally. You trust too easily. Right. And And I thought initially that that was going to be something that was, you know, going to come up, that Mm. there is a clone out there that we can't trust. And are they alluding it to being Emery? Mm. But then I realized he's talking about himself. Yes, he is. Yeah. He's entirely self-focused at this point. He cannot see he has he's he's in his own underworld journey to reclaim the living yep. land. For Crosshair, this story is just as much about him as it is about Omega. Yeah. It always has been. And that's and, why he's in the deepest, darkest prison cell. Yes. In and also <clears throat> how little he is moving. Because like when you're in the underworld, you cannot grow. You're dead. Yep. Right. So yeah, exactly. And um for Emery He's literally living in a Japanese hotel. Like there's Japanese coffin hotels. <laughs> That's where he's stuck all day long. <laughs> all night long. He's paying his one yen or 100 yen to spend the night. <laughs> for for Emery, I think that uh, she gives the doll back because there's a, there's a few things that happen in these three episodes. Um, it, it, psychologically, she is rescuing her past self. Yes. And so she is giving back the power of choice, the power of intuition, the power that comes naturally with her past self to herself, like to her married mm-hmm. version of herself. And um, that in it, in it of is, is that we can see the mirrored version of the, of the sisters, the t- clone sisters in this. It's really interesting how they're using. Oh my God. You made me just literally think I'm like, do I give gifts to my children? And do I do these <laughs> things for my children? Because it's, it's the embodiment of my own past self. I'm like, yes, <laughs> sitting over here in my own, uh, uh, is I'll just therapy? find my own <laughs> Japanese coffin hotel it bunk just, up with crosshair yeah, for a while. Yeah, no. So, so that's, that's like, to me, it's like the glimmer of hope. Yes. Because you actually experience like until you actually have that apotheosis that understanding of your interconnectedness with other people you actually can't leave the underworld you're stuck Mm -hmm. and so she sees herself in omega 
and gives her the doll back. The doll represents the internal power we all have to choose the right path if we listen to our own selves. And so can we choose the right path when all the paths are Are closed or or unknown or unknown? I mean, you have to listen to your own intuition. And in in Star Wars, that is family, uh, compassion, uh, joy, things that bring you happiness. That's a really good point. I was just trying to segue cleanly into episode two. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Sorry. I was like (laughs) off on my own little like. I know. You took your own tangent (laughs) down a very well-known path when we need to go into paths unknown. Paths unknown. Uh, Overall thoughts on the episode? I I I didn't like it. <laughs> okay. I it was kind of uh we need to give them something to do and then yeah. they, it's man versus environment for sure 100%. There are some really interesting things that happen in this episode mm-hmm. that I think are great and worthy of thought. Uh but as a single entity entry so- it's it's a one shot. It's a like, one shot. Not everyone could make it for the D and D game today, <laughs> so we're just gonna play this one thing that I had, and you're gonna go to the wrong location. And it's fine. You'll have fun. Somebody's it like, just won't go anywhere. I have the tales from the Yawning Portal. Let's <laughs> run you through the Lost Shrine of Tamachan. I Which, said that when I know. <laughs> we were listening, watching the episode. And I'm like, hey, yeah. there's all those vines. Which, hey, if there's you are the roper. To this and you want to know about the hidden shrine of Tamochan, uh, where Marie Claire plays a character named Florida Man, and it is everything you expect With from a character ends. named that. <laughs> um, you should check it out on Tavern Tales. I don't normally mention that sort of thing, but like the, the, the motifs and what's going on in this episode are so similar <laughs> to so things similar. that happen we, in the we hidden were shrine like, of Tamochan. Somebody's a big D and D fan. Exactly. When we were. <laughs> She does, but you know it. Uh, yeah. They start out with Hunter and Wrecker bringing a pike to Ursa Durand, who, like during the during her talking, we were like, "Who is that? Who is that?" And we looked it up, and we were both shocked and Absolutely. so happy. Yeah, and I have to think that Angelica Houston will be back. Like she's a big character. You, this you is a don't just introduce the first horned Dever- Deveronian woman and give her seven lines and nothing else. Like, but also I had to wonder, like, that's the normally Deveronian women don't have horns. So are these mm. ceremonial or yeah, are they, they real? Have, they didn't look real to me. They looked kind of. But they're in the exact same spot where the kind of the gaps are for the women Deveronian. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm very interested. Maybe in they intrigued. maybe they cut them off or something I at a younger know. age or something. But I, again, I we don't have know. met or it says uh son roland, roland in the first yes. season absolutely we've seen roland a ton and then we were dealing with pikes then and yeah. spice tr- spice smuggling and it was a whole thing um so yep. it's interesting that they're bringing that back you want to know what's really interesting as well the captain and the pike that they get brought forward both voiced by the same guy that's funny yes liam o'brien who's from like um critical role fame and whatnot oh. he's the guy that voices both the captain and the pike <laughs> that's funny <laughs> it's like so we, funny. we brought you in to do these four lines yeah um so they get this information which is you know vague at best um and they go to the jungle planet and they land and they find these three imperial clones teenage boys roughly about the age yep of well, one's older than the other two. Oh, slightly, yeah. Yeah, and that's inter- it's important because at first I thought all of them were just voiced by the same voice actor. But Mox, Deke, and Stan, Mox is the older one. Deke and Stan are vo- both voiced by somebody else. So Daniel Logan, who does the voice of Mox, much older individual, and Julian Dennison, whose name you would know, because uh, I, I looked yeah. this up while we were watching it, and it is none other than Firestarter from Deadpool. <laughs> Isn't Daniel Logan the actor who plays uh, Boba Fett in The Clone Wars? Like child Boba Fett? Yeah. I don't know. You, I would have to look that up, but I don't know. So put that in the comments or throw that into the YouTube chat here and let us know while, while you or... look it up. Um, to that end, though, I'll also point out some other related pieces of who did the work on this episode. So Paths Unknown was directed by Nathaniel Villanueva, who is one of the go to like individuals they have a structure here for the directors of each of these shows similar to the other two seasons um and you know you now know daniel logan is boba fett in attack of the clones like the movie the movie so the real life human being who was and he also played him in 
the Clone Wars. Yeah, so he's the same kid. Yeah, and I've seen him on stage. It's so rich. That's where I get the name from. I'm very bad with names. I apologize. But I also want to talk about somebody else who's involved in this production, and that is uh, Athena Yvette Portillo, Mm, who is has been a Lucasfilm employee for over or almost 200 animated Star Wars productions. She is the, well, she started as the line producer for the Clone Wars. That's how long she's been around. Uh, she's won, she's won two Emmys with seven nominations. Um, and yet another individual who's from California who got their start in a weird way because she went to school to get a journalism degree and then went into children's books and from children's books turned into like a producer line producer individual who was looking at more the structure over over on it and then she got this job and this opportunity to work under this person who became her serious mentor in all things production Dave Filoni. Mm. Um, Dave Filoni became her mentor in passing in all the different ways and taught her and raised her up to the, this voice. So she is one of the key executive producers of the entire shows. And she was on also the animation side. behind Rebels. Oh, yes. Yeah. Like all the way through Tales mm-hmm. of the Jedi, all of the different shows that have been done through the animation group over at Lu- Lucasfilm. She's had a hand in that. And she's really interesting because she likes to look at things very hands on when it's in the production production piece and she's talking to the animators and developing the schedule as to what it's all going to look like but then once it begins she says she takes this step back and does something she calls macro management once the production is underway she only looks at big picture deliverables and budget in order to properly empower the people under her to do their jobs with the best of their ability oh my god super cool amazing person who is her favorite star wars character ahsoka tech Oh my God, he's going to be back. Tech is her favorite character (laughs) in all of Star Wars. Really? So they asked her when they had this story written, they literally went to her because they know Tech is her favorite character. They asked Athena, they said, so about this ultimate sacrifice, it literally in quotation marks that he's going to make. She said, she said, I love it. That's exactly what Tech would do. You have my approval to go forward with that oh wow so does tech come back i don't know but when you're an executive producer and it's your favorite character in all of star (laughs) wars i kind of feel like well you know it's like the force is with him right (laughs) anyway what a cool human being athena yvette portillo now you know a little bit about her and what she does at star wars that's awesome so back to slither vines (laughs) slither vines yeah so they they have this like very um you know (sighs) standard like hey let's go in there and and get the information deep in it's it's psychological they're going into the tunnels yeah and into the forbidden place they're, to they're go going down the, the wrong path <laughs> they're going down the wrong but they're they're going to to go and collect the treasure that's in the in the fortress that yep. is abandoned yep. and so and it's you know surrounded by the remnants of these monsters that have been created but i wanted to Literally talk about just created you can bring it as because I saw the Wikipedia, which is now not called Wikipedia. It's called like fan page. Starwars.fandom.com is what it's called now, not Wikipedia. They've changed that. Anyway, Starwars.fandom.com at 3 p.m. on Thursday. That's when the entry for Slither Vines was created. That's, I mean, brand new. <laughs> Uh, literally does not exist anywhere else theoretically because they were the creation of this guy not right yet. yeah not yet they could they like they have little like twig blights if you've ever played D D. <laughs> they're oh, running around absolutely and they also have like you know a roper a giant roper a, a sarlacc sar- yeah it's it's huge maybe and, and then maybe when you cut the tendrils off they still move around of their own mm-hmm. volition and run away it, this is a dangerous creature. If it, it is reminds carnivorous. you how all trees are connected in a rainforest, <laughs> you know that sort of thing through well, the true. through the fungus. Um, the the thing I wanted to bring up was the symbolism of having three children look like each other and then, uh, that are introduced. And so this episode brings into focus for Wrecker and Hunter their past, their present, and their future. Mm-hmm. And the fact that only one of them is willing to follow them into the darkness kind of shows uh, an interesting lens to um, how the they themselves have struggled with doing the right thing, even though it's scary. 
Uh, the kids end up help- helping them out in a significant way. And they end up heading to Pabu, which is the um, sort of island sanctuary, idealistic utopia that the clones imagine for themselves. And so it's sort of framing this in a very psychological way to show like you were abandoned, you've had to make some hard decisions, but this is where you're heading to, which is this peaceful place that we all imagine that all clones could go to. Yeah. Everybody that we've saved gets to go there. It doesn't have to just be clones. Could people, could be people that's helped you on the way and, and helped you continue on your journey. Mm -hmm. They get to go to this special place where they will be safe and, they're not because they're not part of the story anymore. Yeah, I think that's what they're also saying is don't just these three boys were great. They were really helpful. Gave you some info. They went to paradise. <laughs> they, they've gotten to go and have a good happy ever after. They like not to call out the island as a movie, but they went to the island. They went to the island. You will never see them again. Yeah. Uh, but it's so funny too because it's very star warsian and and it's indicative of the like like the the actual play that i played called flight risk which was the star wars game all of the people that helped us on our way and saved the day or we converted from being bad guys we would send them to the planet coin where we had basically saved the day there and turned it into kind of an island paradise and so we would send Uh, we would help out all of our people by getting them set up on coin (laughs) that's so that's so cute i mean it is an excellent way to say and they lived happily ever after from a star wars perspective and And not to worry about these guys and not to worry about them and it's legitimately what i want for all the clones to have a clone or clone rebellion yeah to rescue themselves from their situation and all of them live on pavu every single one of them and then we never see them again yeah except for rex and you know because they he comes out and does his own thing but i i want I want the clones to be healed because that would mean that we have get da da broken the curse of the house of Atreus, i.e., yeah. creating only to destroy. And so we are allowing people to live their lives and have the fulfillment to that. And this is entirely in the frame and perspective for Hunter to be like, can you imagine a world where you are no longer a soldier, no longer fighting? Can you imagine a better better tomorrow? And he gives that idea to the kids, but he is also giving it to himself because those kids represent him and Wrecker as well. Past, present, future. And scene. <laughs> so they land on the planet, which is like just yeah. beautiful. Like yet again, another crazy great scene of establish this jungle planet, this jungle scape here that makes you feel like it could have been where they were where where Omega and Hemlock and the group are it could it feels like maybe this was and we're getting a difference in time is this forward in time is this back in time and I just want to say like I loved that it was is so evocative they had so much detail and so much depth and so much character in the animation again but I also want to point out the fact that the soundscape and the music has been the best it's mm. been of the th- of of any of the seasons yet this show is meant to be watched with like full great headphone quality sound in your ears because every single motion and detail has a sound effect associated with it as well as depth and sometimes the sound effects merge right into the music Mm -hmm. and the music itself provides this ambiance and atmosphere it just blends so seamlessly and gives you such a visceral experience for your ears that the voice acting and the top-notch quality of it almost fades into the background at times for the quality of the art and the sound effects and the sound like it could be its own audio version and still give you the same semblance of what's going on that you don't even need the picture in front of you it's incredible um to that end though we don't get the sense of smell from all these other visceral experiences that we're getting. So Wrecker gives that for us, which is always great. Have your characters describe things that are they're experiencing to help it give us. And he says, um, this smells like rotten Joe Taz, which you may have caught. I did not catch that. Yeah. No. This this place smells like rotting Joe Taz. What is rotting Joe Taz? Joe Taz are interesting because they're from the planet Zepho. And so they were introduced in Jedi Fallen Order where you fight a rabid Jotaz. And that's actually like one of the principal hardest super tough fights in the game. If you're playing it on the normal level, if you play it on the easy level, it's still pretty hard. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but that's where they're from. So like, how does Wrecker know about Jotaz from? Well, because they do run into that Zepho. Zepho uh like kaiju the zillow or monster the zillow mon- but it was the <clears throat> it wasn't the zillow monster it was the created like kaiju yes. uh machine that was a zepho machine yeah um and doesn't that monstrous quality with the vines and the way the tendril slap seem zillow monster esque it does yeah i was really like they're all hitting on the same the same ones here sarlacc pit and the zillow monster combined into one sort of you know, living plant that's carnivorous and hungers. The empire is terrible. <laughs> yeah, they're not great. Uh, <laughs> like dictator, dictator, fascist, capitalist regimes will do this. They have no moral compunction in the pursuit yeah. of control and ownership and, and wealth and and what they consider to be like order in their way. Right, or, order for order for thee, but not for me. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a. I, I enjoyed the episode. I enjoyed the thematic elements that were happening with them without like them confronting like baby versions of themselves in yeah. some ways. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I'm happy with the choices that they made with the sort of clones like having to be like, oh, we're going to go steal their ship. But that's not the right thing to do. A hundred percent. Yeah, all of that. And in, in many ways, it it shows also more of that theme of like these abandoned children, these children that are left to just die. And also how the only way if the clones are of a single organism in a way, the only way you can rescue uh, yourself is through rescuing yourself, even the younger versions of yourself. And in some ways what the first episode and the third episode did. And then when you watch this second episode, it seems so, like I said earlier, like, okay, whatever is this episode Mm -hmm. on second viewing of this episode, there's so much more character driven Mm. moments that because you can really sense the desperation and sadness that's eking out of these characters that when they interact with other people or with their environment, they're really coming across with that level of, disappointment in themselves that's really out of their control yeah hunter's so broken right now he's so sad (laughs) he's so broken (laughs) there's this moment um where the maw comes out and marie claire and i because we'd made a comment about the sarlacc pit and we're all connected and the ship's about to take (laughs) off and the things come out both of us just high-fived each other it was the second time we'd done it because you'd also mentioned palpatine's arrival in the next episode and then we high-fived again it was hilarious um anyway there's a moment with hunter looking on uh, as they come back up and they're all celebrating you cannot hear the celebration that's happening they do it is complete it is completely silenced from the celebration you see hunter's perspective he's looking sad and winsome and kind of lost as he sees wrecker and the three boys all celebrating gonky there too and when it cuts to their side you can hear them celebrating and talking and cheering and he looks sad, looking yeah. on to hunter in the background and it made me very scared because if palpit and it made me wonder what's hunter's m count here is this guy who all along has had this preternatural sense of the world around him. His connectivity to the world is always there. And it's super relevant in this episode because he senses things coming before they arrive right. and gets people out of a place that should have trapped and killed everyone else. Yeah, no. And he's always had that like ability to be like a hunter. Yeah. Right. So and, if they oh. don't get Omega, they if might... they don't get mm. Omega as the M count required clone to help in their cloning technology pursuits to make fresh young palps off the vine (laughs) uh pickled snokes is it (laughs) is it going to be hunter interesting oh man i don't i don't like them doing bad things to my children my babies yeah Um, yeah (laughs) (laughs) um I do like that he's like okay finally we have direction right of where they went um but then Omega has to go and rescue herself. Do do do. Let's go yes. on to Shadows of Tantis. Yes, let's uh, let's leave the daylight behind and enter the Shadows of Tantis. Um, directed by Stuart Lee. Oh, okay. And I just have a big thing at the top here. What shadows? <laughs> what shadows? <laughs> what shadows? <laughs> what are the shadows? They're all metaphorical. Just call it Tantis. <laughs> the shadows of Tantis. The shadows on on omega's face to well, make her the, look like crosshair like, the 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 actual planet is called wayland yes i <laughs> and, know and 
Tantus is just the mountain. Tantus is the mountain. Is just the In mountain. Wayland. Yep. Yeah. And so what are the shadows? Well, the shadows that exist in the underworld, Kyle. Yes. Until they can come into the light and become real people again. The shades of the underworld. You I don't want the shades the of Tantalus. Tantalus is where like I know, bad but things like, happen. It is, it is the underworld. It is this place of, of the shades, i.e. everybody is a ghost. Everybody is dead. That is what the shadows of Tantalus means. Tantus uh, means to me. Yep. And we've gotten away from the ticking, clicking water clock of the faucet dripping yeah. into the full on 12 hour clock of, oh, yeah, of, of the, the blood, blood, blood mo- vials. Being, being analyzed that was, and literally ticking down yeah, as that, this episode goes along. That was great. And so the big change is a special VIP is coming. Oh my God. So special that over, and I counted this, over 250 cl- uh, stormtroopers, but I think they're stormtroopers at this point, mm-hmm. over 250 stormtroopers have been told to go stand where the ship is about to be, is about to land. Like, you have to be out there and standing and ready to go before the ship lands. Might be waiting. Yeah, be waiting. Have to be all ready and waiting there. We know mm-hmm. that he's the, she's, okay, his ship is arriving. Everyone go. Everyone has to stand there. The emperor then descends. Hemlock comes walking up to him they have a small conversation no one can hear and then the emperor walks through the ranks into the door and no one is allowed to move the entire time until that happens this is the genuine embodiment of the waste of time and energy that the empire it represents that everyone has to be perfectly in place and unmoving and not doing anything productive while those in power are bearing witness to you. Yeah. He doesn't make a speech to them. He doesn't even recognize they exist or are there. He is just walking through them. His time is more important than yours. Doesn't does Oh that, my god. Does that sound familiar? Um yeah, I yes, but this is like his MO. So it, Absolutely. <laughs> it's just like are they still like I wonder though are they still there when he goes back and he leaves oh, like do they have to wait sure. the whole time I don't know I don't know no, either because I'm sure they didn't go the, after the I'm sure they're about the the base actually guarding the base at that if, time later because they were they were all on like extra shifts too and they're like why are we walking down this hallway at one point yes and they're like oh there's a special VIP we have to like walk down this hallway just to make sure everything's okay yeah there was more <laughs> motivation than that this episode was so good in that everything people have said for both episode one and episode three, all of the discussions that have been had, all Mm -hmm. the things that people have said, even secondarily in the background have had relevancy to the plot. They're doing such a great job of talking about having characters have change and growth and motivation when they speak, but also advancing the plot. If you can make it funny as well, then you've hit the the triumvirate of (laughs) anything somebody says. This isn't a comedy, so not everything needs to be funny unless you're Wrecker. So, um, or tech tech had some zingers. Oh, I just want to bring up. We've moved on from episode two, but I love that he carries Gonky upside down. It oh, seems I like didn't an even, active choice. We didn't even talk about Gonky being used. <laughs> yeah, it, I loved upside Gonky upside down as an active choice. Wrecker makes an active choice to carry <laughs> Gonky upside down. Yes, he does <laughs> both times. Seriously, I cannot wait until Batcher and and Wrecker are together. Yeah. Like that is that I is I want to see the relationship between Batcher and Hunter. That's the kind of oh my gosh that I want to I just, see. I just I feel like Batcher is just like the lost Batcher. Yeah. Right? Like he's been he's been with them the whole time spiritually. Yep. He he will fit right in. I love it so much. Um there's a couple of things that I I really loved about this episode. Um essentially like it's all framed in this way that what has changed, right? And oftentimes psychologically, when we're stuck in this like spiritual death, something has to give or something has to change to snap us out of it. And literally it is the insertion of the most dark and evil thing in the galaxy. Yeah, <laughs> That is what changed. And it, it changed the entire ecosystem mm-hmm. that Omega was in. In fact, it took her to good mother away Yep. And enabled her dark mother to do what she had always wanted to do. And so this equates to the death of the two good mother, much like what happens to Vasilisa. Yeah. And forces Omega to do what? Grow up. Yeah. Use her own intuition. Use her own power for herself to protect herself and others around her. And it is such an interesting 
thing uh, to to literally see her be forced to actually act. And then she's like, wait, I can do all of this. This mm-hmm. is fine. Um, some of the things that are revealed later on the episode, I'll, I'll wait to talk about until we're kind of there because I'm sure you have other things to say. I just want to know how uh, Emery has a doctorate already at her age because he she's called Dr. Carr at one point. <laughs> and I'm like, how old is she that she already has a medical doctorate? Because... I mean, I understand how the clones could be made battle ready in a short amount of time. That's a lot of knowledge to stuff into a brain of of a bounty hunter, right? Like Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Django Fett's not some superstar (laughs) brain child and she is just a normal clone, but but using the two X's as opposed to an X and a Y. And isn't Omega the first clone that was? I don't made or was she the last clone because her name is Omega I don't know if she was the last clone she's definitely a special clone and she doesn't have she was made before the batch that yeah that was clear she is their big sister she's their big sister yeah which even though she's younger than them she's been around longer than them and so that's why she's constantly leading them around by the nose even though they look like adults yes exactly it's delightful and and also they're they're double-aged right yeah which but Dr. Carr is confusing to me because does she age at the normal rate as well does that make her therefore there older hasn't than been Omega? enough time we haven't gotten it so i'm gonna conjecture because mm-hmm. it's also keisha castle hughes and they wouldn't have just brought her in for just a little bit that we're gonna get some sort of emery backstory component piece somewhere that would I be feel cool like if you don't give us that why did you establish this character and i understand her importance in these episodes as as the potential future older omega and what omega could won't become yeah um it's also interesting to me to see how does emery free herself from her own predicament because is she part of the bad batch maybe she's she is, different she from is, all the other she clones. is different um and also like did nala say like not remember her <laughs> like like that's that's some of the things i'm like okay so we know she was kind of taken away by um hemlock uh, which again is a great name, Poison Hemlock. Oh, yeah. Like great no, name, absolutely. Uh, she was Blah. taken away by Hemlock. That's all we learn. I hate him so much. Um, in the same way I hated Ransom so much, <laughs> or Rampart, 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 Treb- Trebuchet, good old Treb. Yeah, Trebuchet, Hemlock. <laughs> I'm the poison. Like yeah, ugh. Royce. I Royce. I could also be a medicine. <laughs> I'm Hemlock. <laughs> I only wear one glove. <laughs> um but okay so we see that because Nalise is no longer able to protect Omega she immediately says Omega you have to do this you have to grow up you have to become autonomous you have to become an adult literally a puberty metaphor right all right here yeah <laughs> your blood is indicating that you have to grow up yeah okay <laughs> um so this is all like ticking down etc and this is the weirdest thing. I've I've talked lots about dark union and what it means psychologically, but it's wild to me that uh, Palpatine needs a dark union of sorts, this DNA combination with Omega, and she has been representing this powerful feminine force within the clones that they have right. been missing. And part of dark union is that they corrupt the power, especially of the feminine for its ill use Mm -hmm. it is all a metaphor for and can be seen as a metaphor for how patriarchal culture like co-ops and pushes down the feminine for its own use wild yep (laughs) incredibly depressing yeah i mean from a from from our own world's perspective no i know but palpatine is like the patriarchy of oh uh, yeah of the galaxy far far away autocratic capitalists yeah it's the worst it's the worst (laughs) yes and there's so many comparables to him in the real world that we have around us that uh yeah drives me insane on a regular day-to-day basis i mean yeah (laughs) um I love that immediately as soon as she's given this, she goes about her plan. She goes and gets the data pad. She goes and gets crosshair and she escapes through. They go and try to escape through Batcher's uh, kennel and Emery stops her. Yep. And this is in a Star Wars term, the equivalent of um, a proposal. Stay with me in the dark side. 
Yep. Don't leave and grow and transform. How am I supposed to use you as a, a way to work through my own past self's uh, <laughs> trauma if yeah. you're gone? Yeah. You have to be here. You have to stay with me so I can make your life better than mine was. And yeah. well, and all, often people who are like stuck in the metaphor of the dark side depression or in substance substance abuse or stuck in their own spiritual death, right? Yeah. They try to keep people with them. You think about Anakin, like wanting to keep people with them. You think about all the dark siders who are like, join me in the dark side. People try to keep you in the dark side because they haven't figured out how to get out themselves. And yeah. it's the the only way out is of your own volition yeah. and you choosing to do that. Yeah. It's perfectly encapsulated in the wives of Dracula. Yeah. Yeah. Join us down here. Come be with us. And th the they dark. relish in your in your living visceralness while sucking the life out of you. Exactly. And that's that's what people do when they're Because if you're trapped down there. here with me, we're trapped down here together. Yeah. This isn't it's a, not a so cell lonely. of my own creating. This yeah. is something we can live in together. Yeah. Oh, horribly depressing. But, but it ends up being bad for everybody around. Yep. Right. So um, Omega makes the right choice. <clears throat> she leaves with Crosshair and she's like guiding him with like this little light that she has just like Vasilisa with the light. And yep. it's her finding the herself, her way to the light uh, and Crosshair being, you know, sort of this masculine that she is healing along the way comes with her and he starts to help. He's like, no, that trail, that's where we're going to go. We're going to find this thing. And they they end up um, fighting off the troopers in the woods and stealing their ride, exactly. which is great. I love it. With the help of Badger. Yeah, of course. it's the best. It's such a great ending to that. And it, it shows like community and compassion. One of these core tenets of Star Wars produces better results than, you know, um, segregation and destruction and yep. consumption. You can escape the shadows of Tantus to go into the light. <laughs> yeah. Light speed. Light speed. <laughs> yeah. On to the next phase of their journey. But I found this these three episodes to be really, really interesting. And they said a lot for me personally. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really enjoyed having Bad Badge back. Yeah. Um, These are strong macho men. <laughs> in the Bad Batch. And so they don't express their feelings. You have to really look and dig to get to their feelings and how they're feeling and how they're changing and how they're growing. Because if you look at Wrecker and Hunter today in that episode, they are not dissimilar in performative styles and in what they do from the first season. Mm -hmm. And you have to really look hard to see how they've grown and changed. And so I would just like to see a little bit more emoting emotion growth and i want to see hunter cry. development <laughs> i i i just feel they're still a little flat oh, at yeah. times where wrecker's just the funny guy you know mm. defective but effective sort of thing and i would like to see a just a touch more growth especially since this is the end yeah yeah, we only have so many episodes left. Um, did we have a death count? There is a death count. Would you like death count? I would love death count. All At right. the end, I mean, I feel like, yeah. What we'll do in season three is death count will happen at the end okay. of each episode. The death count of episode one was five. Five wow. pilots and one droid. <laughs> one droid. And, and of course, we have uh, Omega's death count rising. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Although they weren't responsible, we do know that the beasts in the jungle killed those five in the five yeah. clones or stormtroopers, whichever they were, most likely stormtroopers, but just the pilot folk. And then one droid slain by uh, standing <laughs> underneath a heavy object that somehow got released. <laughs> oh, but it was still alive. Oh, I guess now Omega really has to be the one who orchest orchestrates that death and takes it out with the electron baton. Episode two, death count is... Nothing. No, no. We, we saw one guy fall to his pr proverbial death. The captain who had been bro had broken the rules. Yeah. Um, likely died. Yeah. But we, I don't, mean... we don't get to see too much of that. But one death in episode two. And in episode three, zero deaths. Really? Not even the people that they she fought? Nope. Not even the people she fought. The fight into free crosshair was all stuns. Stuns, yeah. And then the remaining guys, I, th I mean, honestly, they were still close enough Maybe. that they could have gotten out. And there were more than one ship. 
So th- those guys are probably fine. They, I don't think anyone died. I mean, in, they were outside of the, the circle, the protective circle of Mount Tantus. <laughs> they and... still had a chance mm. and still had opportunity to get back. I think they, they were fine. I don't think anybody dies in episode three. and Or if they do, it's not relevant to the story that we get to see their death and be emotionally impacted by it. Right. Okay. Yeah, no one dies in episode three. Okay. That's your call. All right. Yep. I disagree with you want in the comments. <laughs> but that has been Death Count. Death Count. Uh, well, <clears throat> we will uh, be back next week with another episode. There's only one episode next week. So yeah, much shorter recording time next <laughs> week for sure. Let's hope no doubt. All right. Uh, Kyle, where can people find you if they're looking for you? Yeah, you can find me here in Calgary and shake my hand and say, welcome back to <laughs> Bad Batch Season 3. We've missed you. We love having you here. Um, but you can find me um, on Blue Sky at Tavern Tales. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Cheers. Thank you for listening to What the Force. I'm Marie Claire Gould, your host. Our music is Orchestral Music by Christy Carew for What the Force. You can support the show directly on Patreon at patreon.com slash what the force. We'd like to thank all our patrons, especially those who love and are obsessed with What the Force. John, In Wild Space, How Rude, Anna Perez, Neil, Christian Luca, Carly Ann, Scott C., and Susan. Support the show by wearing the force with our merch. Like and subscribe on YouTube or leave a five-star review on iTunes iTunes or other pod apps. It helps others find the show. Connect with us on Twitter at WT Force Show, What the Force Podcast on Facebook. Our website is whattheforce.ca or the Discord link is in the liner notes. Feel free to reach out and start a conversation. Cheers. <laughs>